Hello, I'm Eric Roby. And I'm Kristen Lagana. Welcome to Anne Arundel County Week in Review. Today we'll tell you about the second annual Silipana Music Festival, a long time and beloved North County coach retires, and Suzanne Bates Crandall will be our special in-studio guest. But first, making headlines. County Executive John Leopold and a number of residents of Anne Arundel County and surrounding areas gathered at a Public Service Commission hearing Monday night in Annapolis to voice their frustrations with BG&E's response to the June 29th Dureco storm that knocked out power for more than 762,000 BG&E customers statewide. Mr. Leopold spoke at the hearing, saying BG&E did a poor job communicating with county emergency and fire crews after the storm and should invest in new technology that would allow it to provide county officials with real-time maps of problems to their infrastructure. County officials weren't told where outages were and fire crews couldn't get information about roads blocked by down live wires, which created a public safety hazard, Mr. Leopold said. Citizens complained of the company failing to restore power to their homes for days after the deadly quick-moving storm, providing them with little information as to when power should return. Residents shared stories of having to throw out hundreds of dollars worth of frozen food and moving disabled relatives and friends into hotel rooms because the heat in the days following the storm was too much to handle without air conditioning. Some residents requested the PSC require BG&E to bury the power lines. Others said tree trimming alone is not the answer. The Public Service Commission will use the input from customers at all eight meetings in its review of the utilities, a routine step after large outages. Utilities officials are scheduled to appear before the Commission next month for hearings to defend their storm response. Well, gambling has been on the agenda in Annapolis before a special session of the Senate and the House. The Senate passed a complex and controversial gambling bill 32 to 14 on Tuesday, just before midnight. The House followed suit early on Thursday. The legislation, subject to approval by voters in a November referendum, authorizes a six casino site in Prince George's County and lets the state's five slot machine only casinos add Las Vegas style table games. David Cordish, owner of Maryland Live Casino in Hanover, lobbied against the bill. He argued that Prince George's County facility will take away a chunk of Maryland Live's market share. A large number of Prince George's County Residents oppose gambling and voters in the county may reject the six casino site if they choose. A compromise that garnered some votes for the bill, several delegates said was a last minute amendment allowing veterans organizations to have pool tab gambling machines at their lodges in most Western Shore counties. Veterans groups on the Eastern Shore have had the devices for decades. Well, a large dark gray storm cloud may have loomed over the hundreds of festival goers at the Silopana Music Festival on Saturday, but that did not deter fans or performers from attending the second annual event. Rams had promotions. The festival's organizer took a financial hit last year after high winds from Hurricane Irene swept Maryland, forcing the cancellation of the inaugural event. Aside from a brief downpour and some drizzle around 9 p.m., the festival went on without a hitch and seemed to be a hit with the hundreds who turned up to see 20 local and national headliner bands take the Anne Arundel County Fairgrounds three stages for the day-long event. Some of the local bands featured at the venue included Sun Club, Swamp Candy, Grilled Lincolns, School of Rock, Pasadena, and Bon and Bentley who gave Anne Arundel residents a chuckle with their song, Glen Burnie Trash Girl. Between 6,000 and 7,000 people were expected to attend the festival. If you missed out this year, don't worry. Event organizers hope to make it an annual event. The festival benefited the An Annapolis Musicians Funds for Musicians. That's some amazing names for groups. Right? I mean, they come up with some crazy names and for their bands. They did, and the national acts were um, amazing, too. We had Cake. We had Citizen Cope. I like birthday cake. Birthday cake. Oh, <laughs> cake uh, is the name of a band, I guess. Uh, I cannot work with this. Cake is the name of a band. <laughs> yes, it work is. Work with me here. Work with cake me. Cake is the name of a band. Cake, okay. Do yep. they come out dressed like what? They just dress like pieces of cake? I mean, I, what no, do they do? No, they, they dress pretty normal, mm. Eric. Yeah, yeah. They're just called cake. Just called cake. They're just called cake. Got it. Well, you know, speaking of these interesting things, interesting names, I was down the Ocean City Boardwalk. Everybody get down the beach <laughs> before... Uh, before it gets to be September, it gets to be too cold out there. I'm going this weekend. But the good for you, <laughs> look for these shirts on the boardwalk. Oh, I cannot imagine some of the stuff. Boardwalk They wear. have shirts, people walking around that have shirts that say free hugs. People run up and hug them. Don't go up to those people. <laughs> they Do not have, hug them. It says free hugs. I would not recommend that. And uh, cool story, bro, shirts, and YOLO. Have you heard the term YOLO? You only YOLO? live once, Eric. You, you only, only live, live once. once. You only, only give once. Week in Review once. 
Well, a that's week. some interesting tidbits. But <laughs> folks, did you know the Anne Arundel County Code requires that all cats and dogs residing in our county be licensed? Many residents are not aware of the licensing requirements or mistakenly believe our veterinarians have licensed their pets already. Unfortunately, this is not true. Only the Anne Arundel County Animal Control can issue a pet license. Fortunately, if your pet is not licensed, there's a simple remedy. Licensing applications and associated fees are available online at www.aacounty.org backslash animal control. Just print it out, complete it, and mail it with the applicable fees. The application cannot be completed online. Another option for licensing your pet is to stop by the shelter and complete the process in person. There's a benefit to licensing pets. Licensed pets wearing their license tag can be reunited with their families more quickly and owners can know the whereabouts of their pets sooner. Most people are unaware cats and dogs are required to be licensed. It's a simple process and less expensive to register your pet than to not register them. Fines for not registering your cat or dog can range from $50 to $500. If you have any questions on how to license your pet, call Animal Control at 410-222-8900 and get those pets licensed and get them spayed and neutered too, like Bob Barker used to say. <laughs> That's true. Always look up to Bob Barker. This week, the Anne Arundel County Fire Department responded to more than 1,478 calls for service. This included 1,098 emergency medical calls and 134 fire calls. Three people were hospitalized earlier this week as a result of two different fires that occurred in separate areas of the county. With more on these incidents is Division Chief Michael Cox of the Anne Arundel County Fire Department. Chief. Thanks, Kristen. The first incident occurred just before 8 p.m. on Sunday, August 12, 2012, when Anne Arundel County firefighters responded to the 7900 block of Della Rosa Court in the Pasadena area of the county for a reported dwelling fire. The first unit to arrive on the scene reported visible fire coming from the basement and first floor areas of a two-store middle of the group townhouse. At that time, firefighters immediately requested additional resources and began to stretch hand lines into the interior of the dwelling to begin extinguishing the flames. In all, it took more than 46 firefighters about 20 minutes to bring the two-alarm incident under control. There was one occupant home at the time of the incident, and he was able to escape prior to the arrival of fire department personnel. The occupant, a male estimated to be in his mid-30s or early 40s, suffered serious but non-life-threatening burn injuries. He was airlifted to the burn unit at Hopkins Bayview Medical Center via Maryland State Police helicopter. The fire, which originated in the basement area of the home, caused an estimated $225,000 in damages. The exact cause of the fire remains under investigation, however, it is believed to be accidental in nature. In a second incident, Anne Arundel County firefighters again responded to a reported dwelling fire just after 9 p.m. on Sunday, August 12th. This time, they responded to the 6400 block of Wilbin Road in the Linthicum area of the county. The first units on the scene of this incident reported visible smoke coming from the basement area of a large two-story single-family dwelling. The first arriving firefighters immediately requested a second alarm and initiated an interior fire attack in the basement area of the home. In this case, it took 48 firefighters from Anne Arundel County, Baltimore City, Fort Meade, and the BWI Airport Fire Departments about 30 minutes to bring the incident under control. There were two residents in the home at the time of the incident and both escaped prior to the arrival of the fire department personnel. The occupants, a 54-year-old male and a 51-year-old female, were evaluated at the scene by fire department paramedics and ultimately transported to Baltimore Washington Medical Center via ground ambulance for possible smoke inhalation injuries. Kristen? Thanks, Chief. Investigators have determined that the fire originated in the basement area of the home and caused an estimated $160,000 in damages. The exact cause of the fire remains under investigation. The Red Cross was assisting the residents with temporary housing. Well, there's more Week in Review to come, folks, including our interview with representatives from People's Community Health Centers. As we head into the break, take a look at our community calendar for upcoming events around your county. Stay with us. We'll be right back.
odds of this daughter of a clergyman spending 11 weeks at number one on the U.S. singles charts? One in 19 million. The odds of going on to win six Grammy Awards? One in 1.4 million. The odds of having a child diagnosed with autism? One in 110. I'm Tony Braxton, and I encourage you to learn the signs of autism at AutismSpeaks.org. And welcome back, folks. Well, as you know, a lot of things are happening out in West County with the new Maryland Live Casino, the development out there from base realignment and closure, but there's a lot of things happening on a community level as well. And we've got today two of the major players from People's Community Health Center. We've got Stacy Shiano and uh, Suzanne Bates Crandall, both big players in developing this community health center out there for People's Community Health. Welcome to the program, ladies. Thank you. Thank you. Suzanne, I'm going to start with you. Tell us a little bit about People's Community Health. This is kind of new, uh, a new partner in Anne Arundel County. I know you guys are working well with the school system, and you're trying to build this $9.5 million center uh, to really benefit the uh, community there in Pioneer City. People's Community Health Center is a federally qualified health center that has been operating clinics throughout Baltimore City and Anne Arundel County for over 40 years. We have three sites in Anne Arundel County currently, in, on Brooklyn Park, um, on Ritchie Highway, in Severn and in Odenton. Um, we are an outpatient health facilities that operates um, primary care to all patients, no matter of their ability to pay. So all insurance is uninsured. Um, we see anyone from birth to the elderly. We have pediatrics, OBGYN, family practice, internal medicine, we have our own pharmacy, we have dental suites, mm. and we also offer behavioral health, mental health, and substance abuse services. So it's kind of a one-stop shop for uh, all Absolutely. your health care needs. Absolutely. That's wonderful. And um, from what I understand, you guys have said that you have, um, you're statewide, so you have locations around Maryland. Where are some of your locations at? In Baltimore City. Okay. We have eight locations in Baltimore City and three currently in Anne Arundel County. Great. And what are you guys doing in terms of trying to raise funds? Uh, where can people donate and where can people find you? Well, what we're trying to do right now is get people to go to our Facebook page at the Reese Road Center um, and log in and we'll be able, we'll be keeping people up to date on the project and the building of the new healthcare center and community center. Um, and there you'll find um, ways that we're going to be raising money in the future. One of them is going to be in a brick program. Um, we're going to start out with paper bricks and sell them at the uh, local merchants around town um, to raise money that way. Um, and then eventually when we get into the building of the, um, the whole project, then we're going to be selling real bricks in the community to raise wow. money. Well, this is a $9.5 million project. It's over by Van Bocklin Elementary School. It's in an area of the county that definitely is uh, one of the underserved areas uh, in Anne Arundel County. But tell us a little bit about this, Suzanne. It's, a, it's an interesting concept in that it is a health center, which is mainly paid for through federal funding, but yet there's also going to be another component to the building, a community center. And is that something that uh, people, are, are they leaning towards that model? Yes, yeah, so um, the community has been wanting a community center for over 20 years. When I say the community, the residents, um, Severn Community in Actions, Mrs. G, who is a very well-known um, advocate in that area. Um, and Peoples is now bringing that to reality. Um, and, and also within the medical side, there's also going to be urgent care. Um, we will take emergencies, I'm not sure if you're aware, but individuals in that area, if they're in an emergency, it potentially could take 20, 25 minutes before an ambulance gets to them and then takes them to the nearest emergency room, most likely BWMC. We will now be able to take those um, emergencies to, to assess whether they, they truly are, get them under um, control, stabilized, while the ambulance is coming to pick them up. Um, the community center side um, is going to offer services that those residents and individuals in the community may not otherwise access. Um, they'll be able to come in, maybe go to a computer room, um, apply for jobs, apply for Department of Social Services benefits. Um, there's going to be mentoring programs, so literacy. There's going to be a kitchen that's going to be shared with the um, health clinic as well as the community center to healthy eating, nutrition, cooking classes, um, child care. 
Um, so it's really bringing in health into everyone's lives in their community. Health is what's going to impact everything. Mm -hmm. um, and partnering with various different organizations is going to make that come to reality. Well, I think you just said it right there, and, and Stacy, partnering is the key to this project really getting off the ground. We're looking at a ground, groundbreaking has just occurred. Well, not we've groundbreaking, we had a ground dedication, ground dedication. ceremony, um, and that was to mark the transfer of the land from the Board of Education to mm -hmm. Peoples um, so that we will have that um, possibility in the near future to um, break ground and start building. Um, but we still need to raise uh, like $2.2 .2 million more mm -hmm. um, in order to, you know, make this whole project a reality. Sure. Um, so that's what we'll be doing is, is getting um, partners within the community and the business community. Um, we are looking at other grants some um, and, and from foundations as well mm -hmm. um, to bring in more money. Um, but it's really a community project so we really want to bring in the local people to come in and, and help us with this. Mm -hmm. um, and so we've, we have the Reese Road Task Force um, that's put together by area uh, local business owners and um, just local people in general. Um, we're always looking for new members, so if anyone's interested in um, joining our group, they can also send us a message on our Facebook page um, or give us a call um, at any of the peoples and they can, they can connect you to us. That's great. Well, ladies, best of luck. I know this is going to be a, uh, a big undertaking that both of you will be taking on here for the next year and a half, two years to, to make this a reality for the folks out there in Severn. Folks, a great project. And if you want to learn more about people's community health or the project going on out at Severn near Van Bachlen Elementary School, just go ahead and log on to the website seen at the bottom of the screen and you'll find out all the information you need to know. Ladies, thanks for joining us today on the you. show. Thank you. And we'll be right back with you with more Week in Review, so stay right there. We'll be right back. Welcome back. On August 12, 2012, at approximately 9.30 a.m., members of the Anne Arundel County Police Department were dispatched to the 400 block of Harlem Avenue in Pasadena for a report of a deceased male. Joining us now is Public Information Officer Justin Mulcahy with further details on the investigation. Justin. When officers arrived, a family member reported finding the adult male victim deceased inside of the residence. The Anne Arundel County Police Department's homicide unit responded to the scene and assumed the investigative responsibility. Now, the victim has since been identified as Darius Keenan Sr., age 50, of the address where the incident took place. The body was transported to the office of the chief medical examiner in Baltimore to determine the final cause and manner of death. Also on August 12th, homicide detectives determined that Darius Keenan Sr.'s vehicle was missing from his residence. As a result, a nationwide lookout was broadcasted. Later that same day, members of the North Carolina Highway Patrol located that vehicle in Charlotte, North Carolina. It was stopped and the operator was identified as 26-year-old Darius Keenan Jr. Mr. Keenan Jr. was arrested and charged with numerous traffic violations in North Carolina. Members of the Anne Arundel County Police Department's Homicide Unit traveled to Charlotte, North Carolina to continue this investigation. Several search and seizure warrants were executed and detectives recovered evidence linking Keenan Jr. to his father's death. The Office of the Chief Medical Examiner in Baltimore has since determined that Mr. Keenan's death is a homicide dying as a result of a gunshot wound to the upper torso. The Anne Arundel County Police Department is working closely with the Anne Arundel County State's Attorney's Office, along with assistance from the North Carolina Highway Patrol and the Charlotte Mecklenburg Police Department. The Anne Arundel County Police Department has since charged Darius Keenan Jr. with one count of theft of auto on an arrest warrant. He's being held in Charlotte, North Carolina for traffic charges and on a detainer for that auto theft charge. The Anne Arundel County State's Attorney's Office is seeking his extradition. The homicide investigation of his father, Darius Keenan Sr., is active and ongoing. Anyone with information is urged to contact Detective Jackie Davis. That number is 410-222-3413. Folks, we're going to move on to our second incident. That one took place on August 9th, about 8.23 in the morning. 
Now that's when detectives from the Anne Arundel County Police Department Special Enforcement Section executed a search and seizure warrant at 44 Nicholson Drive in Pasadena. The search warrant was a reference to citizen complaints and into an ongoing investigation about marijuana growing at the residence. Subsequent search of that residence revealed 26 marijuana plants estimated at about $26,000 growing in the backyard. They were ranging in heights from about 3 to 9 feet. Additionally, drug paraphernalia was recovered. Detectives arrested two brothers from that residence, Robert Blake Clodfelter and Ronald James Clodfelter, both charged with various drug-related offenses. Uh, both the suspects are 41 years old and reside at that address, 44 Nicholson Drive in Pasadena, Maryland. Now, folks, as always, if you have any information on any of the crimes or suspects we mentioned on the show, don't hesitate to call, email, or text your tip to Metro Crime Stoppers Hotline. That number is 24 hours a day. It can be reached at one 866 Seven lockup, or you can text message MCS plus your message to crimes at 274637. Third option, visit the website. That's www.metrocrimestoppers.net. As always, remember, those phone calls are not recorded and callers remain anonymous. You might even be eligible for a cash reward of up to $2,000. Back to you. Thanks, Justin. Founded by the late entertainer Danny Thomas, St. Jude's Children's Research Hospital opened on February 4th, 1962. Its mission? to find cures for children with cancer and other catastrophic diseases through research and treatment. St. Jude is the first and only pediatric cancer center to be designated as a comprehensive cancer center by the National Cancer Institute, and this year they celebrate their 50th anniversary. Kelsey McConkie is on location at Ram's Head in downtown Annapolis, where she's joined by Ori Croft to discuss St. Jude's upcoming fundraiser, cocktail reception. Kelsey. This is Kelsey McConkie with Week in Review, and I'm here at Rams Head Live in, on West Street in Annapolis with two representatives from the St. Jude's Research Hospital, and they're going to give us a little bit of information about their upcoming fundraiser that's going to take place here on the 20th. So this is Ori, and he's going to give us a little bit of information about what St. Jude's is and what they do. All right, thank you. Uh, so St. Jude Children's Research Hospital is a hospital that pretty much is uh, dedicated to um, taking care of children with cancer and other deadly diseases. Um, the thing that's unique about the hospital is that it was uh, established to where parents do not have to pay at all. Um, they do not receive a bill. And, um, you know, Danny Thomas was the founder of the hospital, and he started in 1962. Um, since then, we are actually in our 50th anniversary. Um, the survival rate in 1962 of common cancers was only 20%. Now, 50 years later, it is up to 80%. So this is a great cause, and to add to that cause, we're, they're having a fundraiser here at Ram's Head on the 20th. Can you tell us a little bit about that, Erica? Absolutely. Well, we're very thankful to Ram's Head Tavern for letting us have um, next Monday night, uh, Monday the 20th from 6 to 8, as an opportunity to talk to the Annapolis community about the different ways that they can become involved with St. Jude in this area. There are various ways that um, people can help out. There are monetary ways. There are um, also opportunities to volunteer, serve on communities. So next Monday, the 20th, is going to be an opportunity for us to share um, a little bit about the St. Jude mission, some um, patient stories, and then also the different ways that uh, everyone can become involved with St. Jude. Now, do they need to make reservations or let you guys know they're coming or just show up, or how does that work? Actually, yes. Um, the man to email is Ori Croft, and his email address is O R R I dot c or r c r o f t at st jude dot org is that correct or also you can uh get in by calling our office which is 703-351-5171 thanks so much look forward to seeing everyone here on the 20th and working towards a really great cause for st jude's back to you in the studio thanks kelsey sounds like that will be a fun reception in support of a heroic cause well, in this week's Community Spotlight, our own Mark Chang is in, where else, Glen Burnie, where he's reporting on the upcoming annual Glen Burnie Improvement Association's 5K run, which I'm sure he will be running in. Right, Mark? Thanks to both of you in the studio. I'm over here at the BNA Trail right in downtown Glen Burnie, and with me today I have Candy Fonts and Diane Montier, who's part of the annual GBIA 5K race committee. First of all, ladies, thanks for coming on the show. Uh, Candy, if I can start off with you first, could you tell us when the date is and the time of the race? Sure. We're going to start this year. It's our fifth annual event, and it's going to be Saturday, September 29th, and the starting gun will sound at 9 a.m. 
Great. And 5K, if I'm doing my math right, that turns into 3.2 miles. And could you tell us uh, what the race course is like? Sure. It's going to be uh, chip time for the race. It's a flat course along the BNA Trail. We'll start here at the Carnival Grounds. We'll travel south on the BNA Trail, cross over Fifth Avenue and Aqua Heart Road. And then we'll turn around at Norfolk Road and then come back the same way. And we'll have one spot uh, that's a water stop. Okay, great. And that's for all the runners out there. And, and also, there's also a race or a walk, walking route. Could you tell us about that? Sure. The uh, one mile wa fun walk, I'm sorry, will start at the same place. As soon as the um, runners leave, clear the area, we'll take the BNA Trail south. We'll go to Fifth Avenue, turn around, and come back to where we started. That's not timed. Just fun. Okay, great. Well, thanks a lot, Candy. And um, could you tell us uh, what the cost is for each of those events? We have um, actually two sets of costs. There is an early registration discount. If you register by mail by, I believe it's September 16th, the uh, price for runners would be $15. The price for walkers would be eight. If you do it online, the pricing is the same. And that deadline, I believe, is September 26th. And then if you do it after those deadlines, the uh, price increases to $20 per runner, $12 per walker. So of course, we encourage you to register early. Okay, great. And also, uh, it's, well, it's very exciting, so I'm sure folks are going get, to get out there and get geared up and get ready for this race. Um, Diane, it's great to see you. I guess you're all geared up, ready to go for running. Uh, all right, well, I know you're an avid runner. Uh, could you tell the viewers out there how they can register? A um, couple of different ways. You can go to active.com and in the quick search, uh, search for GBIA. You can go to the GBIA website, www.gbia.org. Or you can give us a call at 410-766-6760. And of course, we'll do registration the day of the race as well. Great. Well, uh, coming to the past events, I know the whole event is really exciting, but especially at the end where the trophies come out. And could you tell us about the award ceremony and trophies? Sure. We have a couple different um, groupings. Um, of course, we do overall first and second place for male and female, and then we have age brackets. Um, we're going to do a new trophy this year because we're encouraging groups and um, different organizations to sign up together. And the person who brings the most people um, gets a trophy for their group. Okay, well that's awesome. So it's so it's usually running is about an individual effort, but it's great to have that team effort component to it. Absolutely. Okay. It's a, it's a community event, so we encourage community groups to come out. Great. And also understand there's a wellness component to it. Could you tell us about that? Sure. We're going to have a couple different local groups. Um, we're hoping to have a chiropractor, a massage therapist, um, patient first or some type of clinic group um, to come out um, and oh the Anne Arundel Community College will be here from their nutrition department just to kind of give some uh, tips on eating healthy. Okay thanks so much Diane and thanks so much Candy and uh, I'm going to actually kind of wrap up here and we're going to get started on maybe do a few laps around the, uh, the trail here but uh, yeah but this is definitely a great event and thank you so much ladies and to, to your entire team for always hosting this for the past several years and this is a wonderful event for the folks to get in shape and um, and also to support their community so we hope to see you out here at the GBIA annual 5k race on September 29th that's Saturday so come on out here and as they stated before if you want more information you can contact 410-766-6760 or visit www.gbia.org. Reporting from the B&A Trail in downtown Glen Burnie, back to you in the studio. Thanks, Mark. 25 years ago, President Ronald Reagan told Mikhail Gorbachev to tear down this wall in Berlin. That same year, the O'Malley Senior Center in Odenton opened its doors. This week, Jody Letty attended the silver anniversary of the O'Malley Senior Center and had the chance to speak with the director as well as two of the center's finest patrons, Jody. Hi, I'm Jody Letty. Today I'm at the O'Malley Senior Center in Odenton. With me today are Edie Craddy, the director of the center, as well as patrons Perry and Queen, some leaders here at the community center. And we're going to talk about a special event that occurred here today, as well as some of the other things that happened throughout the year here at the senior center. So, Edie, tell us a little bit about what happened today and uh, about the senior center in general. Sure. We had a wonderful uh, 25th anniversary celebration today. We invited lots of our community partners and we had volunteers and instructors and all kinds of different people attending to help us celebrate what the center is all about. Um, we had a turnout of about 400 people today, um, live band, lots of giveaways and door prizes. We raffled off a Kindle Fire and an iPad. We had a 50-50 raffle um, and lots of refreshments and goodies to be put out and people thoroughly enjoyed the event. I think they had a great day. 
Um, in addition today, we also have um, activities for seniors Monday through Friday. We're open five days a week. We offer probably, I think, of about 60 classes sponsored by the community college per semester. Is that about right, Queen? Yes. About 60 classes. Yes. Um, we have volunteer instructors. We do income tax assistance. We have health insurance help. We have physical fitness activities for older adults, social recreational activities. Um, we have, I think, about three different entertainment programs that come in per month. Yeah. We have tax counseling, retirement seminars, different craft workshops for seniors to take parts in. So it's a wonderful place for people to come and enjoy. Um, it's open to people 55 and older that are, that are independent and able to take care of themselves. Okay, so that's a good point as far as independent and able to take care of themselves. They have to get their own transportation here? The Department of Aging does offer van transportation to and from the senior centers, and you have to arrange for that. All that information is in our newsletter, which is also posted on the county web. Um, but you have, just have to be independent enough to be on your own once you get in here. Okay, great. Perry, I hear that you're very active here at O'Malley Senior Center. Tell us what you like about the center, what you do here, and your experience. How long have you been coming here? I've been here about five years. Uh, <clears throat> I first started here when I took uh, uh, took place in a, a pool tournament that was going on for the county. Uh, we have uh, multi-center tournaments that go between uh, various uh, senior centers. Uh, when I first came here, there were about 12 people in our pool room. I like to think that I was instrumental in uh, elevating that to about 42 players, and we've gone from two to three tables now. Uh, we also have uh, begun a hosting of two multi-center tournaments uh, throughout the year. And uh, also, because I participate in uh, competitive pool uh, in the uh, Baltimore area, uh, and I have uh, won a number of uh, trophies, uh, I now give those trophies out to all, all of the tournaments that we have going on here. I can't say much more than what Edie has. Uh, she's been instrumental in keeping a lot of activities going here. My time is pretty much over in the annex. Uh, in, uh, in the pool room, but anytime this lady needs some help, I like to volunteer to do that. Uh, I've, uh, I've participated in the advisory board uh, here. Uh, my time is up as of last month, but we now have uh, a new board that's beginning, and uh, I've been uh, picked up for another two years on that one. And I also represent this uh, facility here at the uh, Annapolis uh, uh, Department. Department of Aging. So uh, with all of that, uh, Edie's covered it all. Uh, we do have a, a large participation here. Uh, again, my interest is in uh, the pool room and uh, for the benefit of those who do like to shoot pool, my pool team in Baltimore uh, won a pool event and so this coming Saturday I'm going to Las Vegas for a week. All expenses paid on that one. So if you like playing pool, come on out to the O'Malley Center. Thanks. You, you didn't know, I didn't know your name was Perry the Pool Shark. Should have said Perry the Pool Shark. So now we have the Queen over here. Tell us about your experience here at the Senior Center, what you like to do, and your experience meeting people and creating friendships and things like that here. I've been fortunate to be a member here for 16 years. I retired in 1996. And I'm telling you, I get up in the morning and I can't wait to come to O'Malley Senior Center. I take exercise, I take aerobics, I have tried kickboxing. I do almost everything when it comes to exercising. I do a little bit. Sometimes I'm not able to do the whole hour, but it's fun. And then I look forward to serving lunch. It is so great to see the people just eat and enjoy their meals here. It is a wonderful place to come. If you're looking for something to do, this is the place to come. Don't sit at home and just rust away. Come out and enjoy yourself. This is a wonderful place. We have movies on Friday, and I mean first run movies. And we come in and sit down, and uh, Mary McCoskey, who brings in the movies to us, also brings in snacks. And we do look like we need snacks, don't we? But of course, we are anxious about coming and just to see the popcorn and the cookies and candy and stuff she brings in. It helps keep us fat, and we just enjoy this place. It's a great place, and I'm just so very happy that Odenton has been blessed with this wonderful building. And then I took, I learned on the computers here. I, I thought that I knew something about computers until I took the classes here, and it's just been wonderful. We have computers available for you every day. 
There's four across the street in our annex and one over here, and then there are computers in our classroom. And you can come in and just to get your email and enjoy using the facilities here. Look forward to coming here and just enjoy your day. It is a great place to come, and I've enjoyed it. Edie Craddy is one of the best directors anyone could possibly have, and the people are here. Naturally, you have some you'd like to hit, and hit. never mind. Some you love and some, <laughs> and some you have trouble loving, but you still love them all. And it's just great. I love this place, and I thank you so much for coming out and sharing with us on today. This has been a marvelous day. People just kept coming and kept coming. I thought I was going to run out of food but we were able to feed everybody that came in the building today. Bless you and love everybody. Thank you, Queen. It has been a lovely day here. I have thoroughly enjoyed myself. I've been here enjoying the festivities. Danced enough that my feet hurt. I, you were dancing too, weren't line you, Queen? Dance. I forgot about that. Yeah, you do yeah. line dancing. Every Friday, you come out and learn the line dance. I learned how to do all different kinds of country line dances. Great. Yeah, I, I was attempting, but I, I, I had my own groove. I didn't know how to do the line dances. So anyway, it's been a wonderful day. Congratulations on your silver anniversary. Thank you for having me here. And I've, I've really enjoyed myself today. So I'll come back as many times as you'll have me. <laughs> so back to the studio. Thank you. Thanks, Jody. I tell you, that's interesting. Your lead into that about Mikhail Gorbachev. It's just, it's amazing that 25 years ago, there was a country called the USSR. No more. Now it's Russia. They tore the wall down. They tore the wall down. They tore Let it down. Let freedom ring, right? That's right. Well, folks, believe it or not, the summer is almost over. Oh, no. And even with the extreme heat, county residents have been spending time at area parks, enjoying summer concerts and other outdoor activities. But now it's time to start planning for fall and winter. Get out those parkas, folks. And our own Carolyn Ryan is here to help. Carolyn is at Kinder Farm Park to talk with Sander Heisch about the fall winter program guide. Carolyn. It's that time of year again, folks. It is time for the program guide to come out from the Anne Arundel County Department of Recreation and Parks. I'm here at Kinder Park with Sandra Heisch. Thanks for being on the show, Sandra. Thank you. Um, tell us a little bit about this uh, program guide. This is for the fall and winter. Yeah. So that covers what time frame? It covers September through February and includes adult and youth rec programs and also includes parks, events, and programs too. Great. Now when you talk about rec programs, like what types of programs do we have for, for youth, kids, adults going on this year? Oh yes, there's a lot of programs, a lot of great programs. We have a lot of wonderful dance programs for all different ages. We have wonderful aquatic programs. We list both our North Arundel Aquatic Center and our Arundel Olympic Swim Center. And for adults, we also have craft classes, gym classes, all different for all different ages, all different abilities and interests. Great. Like we always like to say a little something for everyone. Yeah, now you mentioned also some park programs and events. Tell us about some of those. I know we've got some fun things coming up this fall. Oh, definitely. In the program guide, we list all the park events and programs. And I like to highlight now that we're here at Kinder Farm Park is the Fall Harvest Festival, which is on October 13th. Great. So here, right here at Kinder Farm Park. Very popular event. Yes, definitely, yes. yes. Great, and we've got a new, um, kind of new event going on also at Quiet Waters. Tell us about that Yes, one. and that event is the Arts and Park, and that is October 13th also, and that's also October 13th and 14th in, at Quiet Waters Park. Great. Now, where can folks find the program guide? Oh, yes, you can find the guide at our libraries, uh, schools, and local government agencies. Also, you can find the whole guide on the Anne Arundel County Recreation Parks website. Great, great. Now that's www.aacounty.org slash recparks. Well, thank you very much again for thank being you. on the show and for putting together such a wonderful program guide. Thank so you. folks, you can find this again. Libraries, come out to the parks and find the program guides. Um, oh, and the program guide actually will be in your local newspaper. Tell us about that. Yes, it will be that. in the Capital newspaper on August 15th and the Maryland Gazette and the West County News August 16th. Great. So. You can find the program guide, and if you can't find it in person, you can always go to our website again, www.aacounty.org slash recparks. So check it out. Find some great programs for you and your family. Back to you in the studio. Thanks, Carolyn. Well, Kristen, we're talking about winter. And when we talk about winter, we got to talk about my favorite word. You know what my favorite word is? It's a four-letter word. Uh, YOLO. 
YOLO. You only live once. Mm. You're back on the boardwalk in Ocean City. <laughs> cool no, story, bro. It's snow, and I'm talking about snow. Are you ready for some do snow? Do you love snow? I do really like I snow. I do too. I don't meet many people that do, and I'm not really, really ready for it right now. I'm still loving 80 degree temperatures, but I love snow, and we haven't had some good snow in a couple years. You really don't meet many people, do you? Because Maryland people <laughs> like snow. That is they not like true. Snow. I hear more complaints about snow than anything else. Well, do, you know, we're going to play a little game here, folks, because oh, I like games, God. and Kristen likes to be embarrassed, so we're going to play a little game. In Baltimore, we get around 20 inches of snow each season, and this year, they're calling for a bad winter. And bad winter means cold, lots of snow. So you ready for some snow facts? All right. All right, let's snow see how on. good she does, folks. I'm gonna give her three questions today, just three. So let's see how well she does here. The most snow ever recorded in a 24 hour period was 76 inches of snow. Can you believe that? 76, 76 Where? inches in the United States. Okay. And that's what my question is gonna be. Was it A, Mount Rainier in Washington State, B, Bend, Oregon, or C, Silver Lake, Colorado. Oregon. She got it wrong, folks. It was Silver Lake, Colorado in 1921, 76 inches of snow in a 24-hour period. It's a lot of snow. All right, we talked about this one already because I love building snowmen. All right. But the largest snowman built wasn't a snowman. It was a snowwoman. Oh, wow. And can you guess, yeah. this snowwoman was built in Maine. Okay. I'm going to give you three choices here. How tall was this snow woman? Okay. And you can play at home too, folks. Was it 27 feet, 52 feet, or 122 feet tall? 52 feet. God. Wrong again, ladies and gentlemen. Two out of road. <laughs> Built in Bethel, Maine in 2008. It was 122 no way. feet tall. No way. How feet did tall. they get up there? They had spruce trees, 30-foot spruce trees oh as gosh. their arms for the snow woman. <laughs> How did they get that Maine. high? All right, you're not doing so well. You're 0 for 2 so far. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. I'm you, not knowledgeable of more snow you facts. Like snow. They're so useful. <laughs> not doing very well. All right, this is this one I think will kind of be an easy one. Oh well, gosh. maybe not. Maybe okay. not. Just give me a, an idea, a range. The Earth. You know you know our mother I'm, Earth. I'm familiar with it. You live there, so you probably know it <laughs> Sometimes. Well. Sometimes, Sometimes live you live there. About what percentage of our Earth, our globe, is covered in ice and snow year-round? What would you think? Just a, just a guess snow. here. And, and if you get close have... to it. No, I'm not giving you guesses on this one. You just got to get a guess. What percentage, snow. what percentage of land area not of water. the globe ice is covered snow. in ice and snow year-round? It's year always round. covered in ice and snow. What percentage? I'll say 28% and the rest is covered by Ed Reed. Oh, that's pretty funny. Ed Reed's getting old, so I don't think the rest is covered by Ed Reed <laughs> I'm anymore. I'm thinking with Ed Reed. Pretty good. Pretty close. Not no. too close. 12% of the globe is 12%. covered in earth and uh, covered I was going to go with 16 snow. first. So not bad. Right. Not bad. All right, here's your prediction. Put it on camera. What will be oh. the snowfall total for the winter of 2012-2013? For Anne Arundel County. BWI Airport, the official snowfall total. What did you say it was for Baltimore? It's around 20 inches. 20 inches? Official snowfall But you, what did you say it was going to be for this year? Hey, stop asking questions. I didn't say. I don't know what it's going to be. It's going to be a bad winter this year. It's going to be a bad winter. Yeah, what do you think? How many inches of snow are we going to get in the Baltimore area, Anne Arundel County? It's going to be bad. At BWI Airport. 46. Oh, my gosh. 46. Time to move to Hawaii, folks. I'm going to go with 28 <laughs> inches of snow this year. 46. 28 inches of snow. <laughs> Let's snow. hope I'm right and Kristen's wrong. Or if you work at Home Depot, let's hope Kristen's right and I'm wrong. <laughs> well, folks, that wraps up this week's edition of Week in Review. You can watch this episode online anytime at www.aacounty.org. Archive episodes are available at blip.tv and on YouTube. You can also subscribe to the free video podcast at iTunes or like us. Yeah, go ahead and do that on Facebook at Rumble TV. Please tune in again next week for more news and highlights from around your county. We'll see you next time.